Luke chapter number 16, we'll begin reading in verse number 19 to the end of the chapter. Luke 16, verse 19. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments. And seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things and likewise Lazarus evil things but now he is comforted and thou art tormented and beside all of this between us and you there is a great gulf fixed so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot neither can they pass to us that would come from thence then he said I pray thee therefore father that thou wouldest send him to my father's house for I have five brethren, that he might testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded. The one rose from the dead. My thoughts this morning are these. There is a heaven to gain and a hell to shun this morning. There is a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. Jesus, I would remind us, is telling of the event. He's the one that's testifying about what's past death's door. You say, well, that's just the preacher's opinion. No, this is the Son of God. You say, well, my Jesus isn't like that. Then you don't have the real one. Because he is the one that told us about what's past death's door. Out into eternity. And he tells of two men. And I want us to look at these two men, these two people that he talks about. And see what he tells us or teaches us from them. He tells us about them and they have two different lives. They have two different deaths. And they have two different destinies. That's what we find here. First, the two lives. One man is prosperous. The other is very poor. One man's healthy. The other is very sick. And he talks about these 
two men. As I studied, there are some who say, well, this is the great reversal that's going to take place. You know, the rich, they're going to wind up getting their payday one of these days and they'll be out there in eternity and they're going to wind up going to hell. And the poor, they're going to go to heaven and be with the people of God in Abraham's bosom. Let me say, that is not at all what it's teaching. There is the contrast between rich and poor, healthy and unhealthy in the passage, but that's not what it's teaching. You say, how do you know? Because there are plenty of people. Abraham was what we would call filthy wealthy and right with God. So it doesn't have any... See, this one who's poor is saved. Poor and sick is his lot in life. And yet he knows the true and living God. And he goes to heaven. So see, it's not talking about that. You know, measuring if you're right with God based on those kinds of things. Financial status and such. Uh, there is going to be a reversal for these two. Things are going to be exact opposites for them, uh, but not because one's rich and one's poor, or one's healthy and one is not. Look at verse number 13. It says, uh, if money is your God, then God is not your God. See what it said, verse 13, just in the context above our story. Jesus said, no servant can serve two masters. He will either hate the one and love the other, or he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon or money or material stuff. And so if you're going to make material stuff your chief goal in life, if it's going to become the idol of your life, it's going to be called the shot about everything in your life, then God can't be your God. You've made money your God. And so there is that context and there's the warning about the danger of money. And that probably is why he told about a rich man and the danger faring sumptuously, showing off in his purple every day, costly garments and displaying himself and saying, want everybody to look at me, look what I am. I've got more than you've got and superior spirit and all that he had. In Luke 18, just a couple of pages over, look at there, verse number 25, Jesus did say this a bit later. He said, for it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they said, who then can be saved? And he said, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. And that just simply put means that it'll take God for a rich man to get saved because he tends to trust his riches. Riches tend to be a hindrance to him in getting right with God. Coming under the Lordship of the true living God and the Lord Jesus Christ. So, but yet even with that, the powerful God of heaven can break a heart and the pride of a proud man who's self-sufficient or thinks he is, and bring him to a place of repentance and to Christ and a, into a genuine conversion and change of heart so that God becomes his God and not money. Riches, there's the warning there. It, it, he says, look at verse number 14 and 15. And the Pharisees, leading into our story, Verse 14, 15, the Pharisees who were covetous. So see, there's a problem. They are covetous. They want more. They're all about things. They're all about gaining something selfishly for the... 
and all of that kind of self, selfish desire that's not surrendered to God. Covetous. So, there's the story. Two different lives. One's rich. The other is carried down to the rich man's gate. And just hoping that somehow the rich man will throw him a little something. And there he lay. Finding relief from, I suppose, the wild dogs coming along and licking his sores on his skin and on his body. Two different lives. Two different deaths as well. You do know that the saved and unsaved die differently? I mean, they both die. But they die differently. We read about it. One's making a trip to Abraham's bosom to where the people of God are, where Abraham is, we're told. The father of the faith. The other makes a trip to where the unbelievers are. Look at verse 22. And it came to pass that the beggar, Lazarus, is his name, died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. An angelic escort. Escorted by God sending angels to this man. And he's taken to be with the people of God. Materially poor. Physically sick. But right with God. Sin. Hand that out to the modern TV preacher who's telling us if you're right, God's going to bless you. And you're going to have... Preeminent health, and you'll have preeminent bank account, and you're going to have this, that, and something else. That's a false gospel. It's not the truth. God said He'd tend to needs, and He permits even those kinds of things, poverty and sickness, for His purposes in His children. But we have an angelic escort. Here, here he is, the man is unimportant to the world. But he's so important to heaven that God sends angels to get him and to get his soul. There's no kind of record about any kind of funeral. Now we're told the other man died and was buried. He had, he had some kind of funeral. Probably the eulogy was grand. Oh, how he'd financed the community. They tell me that often those that were sick like this and those who were beggars like this man was a beggar. They tell me that it was common practice for them to throw them into the city dung hill to be burned. No burial, nothing like anything, but just throw them out and burn them. This world treats Lazarus as trash. But Almighty God, how's He treat him? Oh, Angels, come on, get get rid, get on down there. We got one of ours. He's so valuable. Get him, get him, get him. Hurry up, get down there, get him. Trash to the world. A treasure to God. Verse 
valuable. Heavenly escort. There's a promise for God's children in Psalm 23 and 4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they come. The Lord's with us. The child of God, he's with us in our passing at a point of death when we make the crossing. He's with us. He's our shepherd. There's no word here from the Son of God that God is anywhere about the rich man at his death. There's no comfort there because there's no shepherd to tend to his sheep because he's not his sheep. They're not his sheep. He's not their shepherd. Right? People die different. Death for the child of God is different than for the unsaved. David Hume, born in the 1700s in Scotland, the father of modern skepticism, attacked Christianity every, every chance he got and tried to undercut it and tried to undermine on his deathbed. He said, I've searched for light for all of my life, but I'm now in greater darkness than ever. Come down to death Transitioning from this world to the next. And there's no light like the people of God have. No hope. No sensed presence of angelic beings and the true and living God. Only a recognition. I've missed it. Two different deaths. Two different men, two different deaths. Two different lives, two different destinies. Verse 22 tells us that Lazarus is in Abraham's bosom, the place where Abraham is and the people of God are. Verse 25 tells us that he is comforted. And so here he is. He has escaped a body that he's been imprisoned by. He, he escapes the pain of sores all over his body. He escapes the daily struggle of trying to find something to eat and the worry and the fret about how the hunger pains are going to get satisfied. He's been released from somebody that's had to pack him down to the rich man's gate every day. And all of the sorrow and sadness and death and pain and the devil's oppressions. Can you imagine how he, yeah, ha! <laughs> if God loved you, if God loved, why he wouldn't be letting you go through this kind of stuff? And all the satanic attack, and there he is. He winds up in the presence of God with the people of God, and there he is, absolutely done with all of that stuff forever. What a destiny. I read the passage in Revelation chapter number 21 and uh, verse 4. Yeah, 21, 4. It says, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And it says, And there shall be no more death, 
neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away, and things are going to change for the child of God. What a destiny. That's the Word of God. What a destiny. Well, what about the rich man? It goes on. Look at the rest of the verse, verse 22 and 23. It says, the rich man also died. You hear that? It's appointed that the man wants to die and after that the judgment. All are going to. No, I, the, the, I don't know of anybody that's, well, there might be a rapture here or there that's taken place. Enoch. Might be somebody that missed death. But basically speaking, all die. Lay down the house that they live in. We are more than just a body, you know. This is just the house we're living in. And it's getting a bit decapitated the older we get. And we're going to lay it off. But you'll be just as much alive death day as you more alive than you have ever been. You say not so. Well the rich man is in hell and he lifts up his eyes and he's talking and he's seeing and he talks to Abraham. Abraham talks back. Conscious existence after this life. And the rich man died and was buried and in hell lift up his eyes being in torments. And he saw Lazarus afar off and all. Discomforted. The thing that grabbed me this time looking at this text is that in, in one way, in some way, this unsaved man is still the same. I mean, here he is, he knows, now he knows there is a true and living God. Now he knows that Jesus Christ is Lord. Now he knows that there is a place of justice and punishment for people after this life. And he knows all of that. And yet he's still unchanged in his heart. It, it doesn't bring him to a place of submission. He's not repenting. He's not, he's not trying to get right with God himself. He does have some kind of concern about his brothers. But he's not changing. Instead you'll find that he's got the same kind of spirit he had when he wore his purple here on this planet. Same kind of attitude. You say, uh, what do you mean? Well, his attitude is still selfish. He still has a superior spirit about him. Look at verse 24. The rich man asked Abraham. He's able to see him. Of course, there's a gulf fixed. You can't get from where the people of God are to where the unsaved are. The unsaved can't get to where the people of God are. You might as well forget about purgatory. It's not happening. Whatever you're about with God this morning determines where you will be fixed after this life. Oh, God will give, give me another chance and oh, it will all get straightened out after this life. No, 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 it's not going to. You have to get right with Jesus Christ now in this life or you will never be able to. You'll never even want to because your nature won't ever even change. Look what verse 24 says about this man, unsaved man. He asked Abraham to send Lazarus. With some water to cool his tongue. The rich man is still 
treating Lazarus as though he's just a servant boy. Particularly a little servant for him. You say, well, oh, they'll get into hell and they'll, they'll start repenting and get right with God and all that. No, no, he's still got a haughty, superior spirit about him, even in hell. It's just crazy, mind-boggling. It just shows the nature of humanity. It has to be changed. It has to be changed. Revelation says, let him that is unjust be unjust still. Let him that's filthy be filthy still. And it says that in eternity, that's just how you go. However you got in this life is how you're going to be then. Have mercy upon me. Send Lazarus. To cool my tongue. Verse 27. He's still treating Lazarus as though he's a servant. He said send him to my father's house. He's concerned about his own comfort. He's concerned about his own family. He And the, that, that part's commendable as far as concerned about his family. But it seems to me as though he still has this bossing people around kind of spirit. This, oh yeah, get that old filthy thing over there. Yeah, and I don't know he doesn't say that. But the idea is still have him serve. Why, why, didn't, why didn't he talk to Lazarus and say, Lazarus, I'm sorry I didn't care just even hardly at all about you. I looked at you, kicked you around, and sent the dogs out to you, hoping they'd run you off, but they licked you. I, all the, none of that apologizing, none of that kind of stuff toward him. Didn't even talk to him. He saw him there. All he does is talk to Abraham. Will you please have him fetch some stuff for me? Same old spirit. Of a rich man who's no longer rich. Superior spirit. Look at Abraham's response. Verse number 29. And Abraham said unto him, he, verse 28, he said, I have five brethren that he may testify to them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Send, please send him the beggar to give him gospel truth that they'll repent they'll get right they're, they're going to prepare to meet, meet you and that'll take care of it verse 29 Abraham said to him they have Moses and the prophets let them hear them they have the written word of God they have the word of God Moses said let them hear the written word of God. Excuse me, Abraham says. He, he, he exalts the word of God to where it belongs, where it should be. Oh, if just somehow we can see some wow, supernatural, somebody coming up from the dead or something. Man, we get converts everywhere. They, they'd get saved. You know they'd get saved if we could just have some kind of healing meeting and somebody died and we saw somebody raise them from the dead. That tend to take care of it. Certainly folks would believe. No, no, that's not so. You do know that Lazarus, later on, John 11, raised from the dead. You'd have thought all this crowd had been delighted about it. You know what? They were absolutely angry. Somehow they're getting credit and we're not. Pride and all that kind of business. And they, they, they would have killed Lazarus. And certainly were mad about the Lord Jesus. And determined to kill him. After he, after the Son of God comes up from the dead. They still don't believe. They still do not believe. Why? Because it does, God's design is not... Conversion by miracle. It is conversion by what I'm doing this morning. 
taking the story Jesus told and just telling you about it. And if you won't get saved under that, you won't get saved. Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. But look what happens. Abraham gives that information to him. Says Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. Look at verse number 30. This rich man in hell proceeds to tell Abraham. The first word that he says to him. What's the first word he says to Abraham? Nope! That's not how it works. Abraham. A man in hell. Unconverted man in hell knows better how to get folks to God than Abraham knows. You're talking about an unchanged heart. In hell. You say, well, certain folks will certainly get right with God once they get there. No, their heart's stuck. In depravity and pride and rebellion against God and God's way. Still the same. He says, No, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded the one rose from the dead. It's just a, a warning to us. It, it, it should put a trembling in the heart. <clears throat> Knowing the danger, it's possible that a person could die and be stuck in an unbelieving, unsurrendered Here he is. He, he still thinks he's the smartest guy in the room. Doesn't he? Oh, Abraham, you know. I know you've been in heaven for thousands of years. And, and I, you walk with God and so on, experience to a living God. I know you know about the Lord Jesus and, and that he's the Lord. He's getting ready to go to the cross. I, I know about all, but let me tell you something. Is it crazy? It is crazy. But it's true. Because Jesus said it was. You say, yeah, just a preacher talking about two, two guys and two different lives, two different deaths, two different destinies. No. All I'm doing is reading to us what Jesus said. This is God's word. This is God's warning. If you won't hear it and believe by calling on the Son of God, by trusting the promise of the Son of God, He's the storyteller, and the storyteller is telling us how to be saved. And the way you're going to be saved is by coming to Him, the Savior. You're going to get saved by repentance, a change of thinking about how I get to heaven. 
Oh, I can just do whatever I want most of my life as long as I keep throwing a little money in the community like the rich man did. Right? As long as I put a little scrum, little crumbs from the table down at the gate for that poor sick man. No, that's not how you get sick. The Son of God's going to take all of the judgment for your sins at Calvary's cross. And you can't change yourself. The best you can do is come to Him and say, Cleanse me. Please change me. And then trust Him to do it. You know the Bible says, Lean not into thy own understanding. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not into thine own understanding. Lean. You know what we do? We like to lean. Like, like you lean on a cane. Well, you're still holding yourself up. And if you don't watch out, you're going to fall. You can't hold the cane and you'll get a little wobbly. And depending on you, I, I might understand the way I'm... A, no. You know what God said? Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not into thine own understanding. Trusting is not leaning. Trusting is like can be illustrated as putting all of your weight upon Him. Which means what you do is you come to the Lord and you, you're no longer just leaning on the cane kind of thing you just lay down totally and put all of your weight like you would a bed and he's going to hold me trust I'm no longer trying it myself all I'm doing is come to him and I'm going to lay down I'm not leaning on anything of me. That's how you get saved. And there is a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. Jesus told us about it. Let's stand. How about let's sing just as I am. I don't know what page it is. What is it? 270. Page 270. Come just like you are. Proud, superior. Look down your nose at other people. I'm better than you are. I know a better way than Abraham knows. And come and say, Lord, I'm a proud, stiff-necked sinner. Forgive me. if you'll have me. Please start working on me and change me. It's 
It's going to be the difference between heaven or hell for you. Do you hear that? It's going to be the difference between heaven or hell for you. Where will you be? Five minutes after death. Has God got something carrying you to hell? Or has God got something carrying you to heaven? If you're His, He's got the angels tending to you. Eternal torment or eternal comfort, one of the two, Jesus said. Well, I'm not worried about that right now. I'm just worried about life and living right now and tending to things today. And all. You better start thinking about past that. Because Jesus said it. Hell is real. Yeah, God's going to straighten stuff out. He's a God of justice. Listen, if I got what I justly deserved, it would be punishment. Every one of us were high-handedly rebellious and proud and arrogant, want to be our own gods instead of the true God, submitting to the true God. Everybody that's going to heaven goes because of mercy. Not justice. What about you this morning? You say, well, it don't even trouble me to think about it. I'd be worried about that. I'd get troubled that I'm not troubled. Are you saved? Are you saved? Kenny Scott, dismiss us, please.